be joined by an absolutely stellar cast of scholars uh, to think about the various ways in which COVID has raised challenges for our world, for our values, but especially for the way in which gender equality is realised in the different domains of our life. So we have a number of panellists who will give us uh, reflections on their particular area of expertise, and then we will turn over to our members and broader audience for their reflections and questions. Please feel free to turn on the chat function in Zoom and to post your questions throughout the panel. And Gronya and I will do our best uh, to pick up on those and pose those questions to the panellists toward the second half of our hour together. So, uh, our first uh, speaker or panellist is Professor Betsy Stevenson, who is well known to many of you for her work as an economist on gender and labour. She is a professor at the Ford School uh, at, of Public Policy at the University of Michigan, having previously served as Chief Economist for uh, the Department of Labour and on the Council of Economic Advisors uh, in uh, the Obama administration. So Betsy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our next panelist, Professor Ruth Rubio-Marin, who's a Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of Sevilla, who's well known to ICONS members for her brilliant keynote uh, a few years back on gender and public law and whose work on uh, gender, care, and the broader dimensions of how we think about gender and public law is well known to all of you. Uh, the next panelist is Professor Iola Solanka, who's also a member of the ICONS Council and a great supporter of ICONS who's Professor of EU Law and Social Justice at the University of Leeds and whose work on anti-discrimination law uh, as well as EU law is obviously a common reference in all our work uh, and a lead voice on the intersectional aspects of the challenges and we'll be talking about that with us uh, today. We also have uh, Associate Professor Marcelo Prieto Rodolfi, who is uh, recently of the USC uh, School of Law Gould, and who is uh, for her sins Associate Editor of, of ICON, the journal of uh, um, associated with Icon S and which will be the focus of a panel after this on uh, gender and public law, which is being led by Marcella and our final um, panellist, Professor Michaela Hellbronner, who's a Professor of Public Law and Human Rights at Giessen and who is the book editor for ICON and works closely with Gronje and Marcella in that context. So there are panellists and we're going to try and ask them a little bit about th how COVID has impacted in various different ways on aspects of our life. So first of all, over to you, Betsy. Can you tell us a little bit about the broad picture of how COVID has impacted along gender lines? Who's got the disease? who's suffered and most importantly, how those economic effects have played out in gendered terms? Well, let's uh, start with uh, the labor market. And uh, first of all, this in a normal recession, men tend to lose jobs more than women. Um, and that's because the types of occupations that men are, the, are more predominantly numbered in um, are the ones that tend to be more cyclical. So if you think about um, things like construction that tend to slow down when the economy weakens. Um, this played out very differently, but I do want to start with like the big picture thing is if you look at least in the United States, but I've been seeing the same kind of problems in Canada and I think in other countries, which is um, that uh, it, it's really been hard to code what's happened to people. What we can look at is were you at work or not at work? Whether you, we code you up as unemployed or, or uh, on leave is, uh, varies not just by country, but actually by, co by the person collecting the data. So in the United States, one in four people who were employed in February um, spent some time not at work, um, not getting paid uh, because of COVID. So that's huge, but that was really disproportionately impacting women. So uh, I call it a gendered shutdown. And that's because the types of things that shut down, leisure hospitality, uh, retail sales, and even non-essential healthcare work, uh, because of course the healthcare industry didn't wanna be a vector of spreading the disease. So um, you know, we didn't have people going into, um, we didn't have people going into dermatology office or dentist office and women, um, in the United States hold almost 80% of the jobs in the healthcare sector. So 
um, when that started to shut down, that really disproportionately impacted women. So we've seen women uh, lose work, stay, lose work temporarily. So a lot of uh, those in healthcare have come back already and will continue to come back. But we have a, another problem that I think is really looming underneath um, the surface for women. And I can tell you, we don't even really see it in the data yet, but I, I, I I'll just pa pause one second. Uh, uh, there we are. Thanks, Betsy. I also rem uh, was remiss in not introducing Julie Sip, but I do that. I'll do that properly once you finish, Betsy. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay. So I was going to say, um, really, I, I think the thing that people are really concerned about um, right now is thinking about how the, the ways in which women's caregiving responsibilities are going to intersect with um, uh, are going to to intersect with their other outcomes, and um, you know if uh, you know as it the ways in which uh, caregiving tends to impact women's labor market is some is really slowly over time as you decide I need to to, to take some time out of work or I need to switch to a, a job that's part time or a job that has more flexibility. What that does is limits career options, but it really does tend to occur slowly. And what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of women trying to reevaluate what their role is going to be, not just in caring for their children, but caring for um, their, you know, aged parents, their aged in-laws, other uh, adults in their life that need care. And then when you, you know, you ask the question about um, you know, COVID as a disease's impact, um, gendered impact. And, and on that, I mean, I'm not an, an expert, but what I have seen is, you know, it really depends on the country that you're in and the community that you're in, whether you see women getting it more than men. So in Detroit, uh, it looked like it was leaning towards women getting it more, whereas in other countries, I've seen men getting it more. And that has, I think, a lot to do with the underlying uh, comorbidities, but again, I'm not an expert there. But what it is something that falls disproportionately on women is who's going to do the caretaking of people who are sick, um, of of people who have long term recoveries uh, that need additional care. You now, the real implication of COVID, I think we haven't explored very much, is what will be the long run health effects and how much care will people need given those long run health effects and then who's going to provide that care. Um, and I, I think that, that is, the long run impacts of COVID are going to be what really disproportionately falls on women as they start to restructure their lives in a way that allows them to ensure that their, their children don't fall behind in this period of time where school is not available as much. Um, and it can take many years to catch kids up. And a, a lot of women may think that they need to be there uh, to be helping their children, both with the mental health repercussions and the education repercussions of all of this, um, and then providing that care for adults in their lives that need it. What we see in the data is that adult, when, when you need to provide care for adults, flexibility in work is really important. Um, and so I think we're gonna really, find out whether our policymakers and frankly the men in our communities step up in a way that prevents a lot of permanent scarring for women in the labor market or whether this is something that ends up setting women back several decades. Well, very sobering words. The idea that we will be waiting five, 10 years to see the full repercussions of what we're currently grappling with both educationally, but especially for women and as they make choices around care and career. I, I was very remiss in not introducing Professor Julie Sook, who is currently Dean for Master's Programs at the Graduate Centre at CUNY and currently visiting professor at the Yale Law School. And it's a great segue because Julie has been working for many years along with Ruth and others on care uh, and its relationship to gender and public law uh, commitments to equality. And she's a, just very recently launched her new book, 
uh, we, the women, the unstoppable mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment, we'll talk to her about that in just a minute, but I do wanted to apologise and welcome you, Julie, and make the connection to, to Betsy's comment about care and mothering, because of course, that's part of what you have been so important uh, in working on, especially for public lawyers. So over to you, Gronje, to talk to Ruth about some of those themes around care and gendered violence. Great, thank you very much, Roz, and uh, hello to everyone and um, welcome again to the, the webinar. Um, Ruth, you have written extensively on many aspects of uh, gender and public law, but um, gendered violence is one of the dimensions that you've addressed. And the statistics, even regardless of this pandemic, the statistics on domestic violence are very sobering. Um, I was uh, checking yesterday um, the US National Domestic Violence uh, hotline statistics and they mentioned that on average in the US 24 persons per minute are victims of rape, domestic violence or stalking by an intimate partner. Um, that's not only women though it is very largely um, women but intimate partners more generally. Um, those statistics are quite shocking. But we also know um, that during the pandemic as people have been you know, locked down together, um, there's been an even more uh, difficult situation for people who are the uh, victims of domestic violence, who are often locked down with um, abusers in situations of great stress. And the statistics have changed even in the last few months. So I wondered if you could um, talk to us a bit about this, first of all, about what has happened during the pandemic um, in terms of domestic violence. But Maybe, and maybe this question is a little unfair since I haven't found much that's uplifting myself, but whether there are any policy responses emerging from either governments, from uh, NGOs, or from international institutions that might begin to try to um, address this, even within the context of the pandemic. Thank you, Grania, and uh, so nice to see you all. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned the fact that this is not just a, you know, we have a pandemic situation that's called violence against women. That's a pandemic situation in itself. And of course you mentioned the numbers in the US, but let's remember that the European Institute for Gender Equality throws equally shocking numbers uh, when it, uh, its statistics report that 33% of women age uh, 15 or over have experienced in Europe physical and or sexual violence. So it is shocking. And of course, uh, as you well say, there is a documented rise in domestic abuse during times of crisis and natural disasters. This is not just COVID, there's literature that shows that Ebola, cholera, Zika had the same effect, that there was uh, an increase in uh, violence uh, against women. Now, of course, you can imagine victims um, living uh, with exposed to abusers, abusers who are themselves uh, subject to heightened degrees of stress in a situation of deprivation, whether it be lack of space in overcrowded housing, lack of food, data, Wi-Fi wi connections in many parts of the world, very scarce resource, sometimes with increased substance abuse and cut off uh, from social and institutional support, including the justice system, police, health and trauma services, as well as shelters. Um, so, you know, at the same time, something we've, we've seen during COVID is that because it's a medical emergency, then um, threats to sexual and reproductive health rights appearing, these are not necessarily considered always as a priority. And so women who are exposed to, se to um, sexual violence suffer then a, a double burden and enhance um, security risks. Now we don't have numbers yet because of course it's too soon, but the numbers do seem to indicate, you know, from a 32 jump, 32% jump in reported domestic violence in France um, in a certain time span, Cyprus again, 30% um, increase in police reporting in spite of the difficulties of accessing police, but also uh, Jingxu in China tripled in February 2020 its um, reported cases of domestic violence compared to a similar period last year. Now I don't know that there is any that there is any um, 
you know, policy response to this as of yet that can be, but what I want to uh, underline is, is the importance, I think, of tying um, uh, what Betsy was addressing and basically the enhanced economic vulnerability and dependency of women as a result of uh, the lockdowns, but also the aftermath um, and the question of violence against women, because of course, um, what it means, this economic enhanced economic vulnerability is uh, less um, exit options in the met and longer term from um, violent relationships. And uh, Betsy was referring to the US, but um, in Germany, 27% of mothers reduce their working hours to look after their children compared to 16% of the fathers. In many women, an estimated 20% in Italy simply dropped out of the labor market during the lockdown. Um, so more exposure to severe forms of violence, less of an opportunity to exit those violent relationships. Um, I, I am also not very um, optimistic, um, probably because just uh, two days ago, I read um, um, a document that I recommend you, which is a next generation EU leaves behind women gender impact assessment of the European Commission for proposal for the EU recovery plan by uh, Klatzer and Rinaldi. And these authors basically well do that, a gender impact assessment of the recovery plan and their um, response or their analysis is not uh, grounds for optimism. Um, they underline how the um, efforts in recovery are put into uh, domains or sectors in which male employment, employment is higher, including the digital, energy, agriculture, construction, and transport, but leaving out precisely the domains that Betsy was mentioning as uh, predominantly female. Um, so the core seems to be placed on transformation towards a digital and a green econ economy. And as welcome as these are, uh, neither the recovery of the care sector nor a transition towards a care economy um, are included in these plans. And yet, um, as I say, uh, you know, economic empowerment is essential to overcome uh, violence against women. And violence against women is very costly. Um, I thought uh, these authors draw an analysis that um, I thought was very illuminating. They say the cost of EU gender-based violence against women, and this is again, European Institute of Gender Equality, very serious statistics. There's a calculation that, um, that this cost um, uh, amounts to 259 billion um, um, annually. And that is, they say, one more than one third of the 750 billion recovery instrument. So basically investments in ending violence against women would save billions and create a more democratic and resilient human rights based European Europe. But unfortunately, I don't think um, all of this is being foregrounded. Um, and I think that part of the reason is that we still don't have you know, parity when it comes to decision-making positions. If you look at the governments, but if also the committees that have been formed uh, by way of emergency responses, you will see that we are really far from parity and therefore from ensuring or at least um, increasing the chances that women sitting at the table would be mainstreaming post-COVID policies, encouraging gender budgeting, and basically crafting policies that would ensure a better work-life balance uh, for all. Thank you very much, um, Ruth. And I think I'm sure most people who are listening to the webinar will have seen the reporting of a very small statistic, but an interesting one of how much better um, countries that are led by women during COVID have been doing <laughs> compared with um, countries led by men and governments uh, led by men. But that, of course, is uh, uh, just one feature of um, the, the situation that we're discussing. And I think something that's coming out from certainly the discussion with Betsy and Ruth so far, and I think we'll see as we move through um, the other panelists um, and their comments is how interconnected these issues are. You know, we have divided up the subject for the purposes of this uh, webinar into 
um, violence, economic impact, care work and so on. But these are intimately, um, and I use the word advisedly, related um, when it comes to the, the gendered impact. Um, so with that, let me uh, hand back over um, to Roz, who's going to bring in um, Julie on care work. And obviously, you should also feel free to weigh in on this issue, Ruth, given how closely you've worked on it. But Julie, the, the care demands um, that have been placed on parents uh, have had a gendered sort of skew. Can you talk about that and in any general terms and what we can or should be doing about it? And then I want to ask you a bit about how you've grappled with it uh, in completing this important new book. So to the general and then the personal, if you will let us get to that in a minute. All right, thank you so much for having me on this webinar. And of course, the general is, uh, in many respects, uh, personal. Uh, so one of the things that I have been working on over the years is gender equality commitments in constitutions around the world uh, and the United States lack of a sex equality provision. And that's what the current struggle for the Equal Rights Amendment 100 years in the making is about. And I've written a book about the 100 year battle uh, to get a gender equality a provision in the US Constitution. But the scholarly insight that gave rise to this work was the idea that gender equality uh, in constitutions and in public law uh, is not only or should not only be a commitment to non-discrimination, uh, but a commitment to having a fair infrastructure of social reproduction. Uh, meaning that generally, if we can account for uh, the history of gender inequality, uh, both in the law and in society, uh, as stemming from uh, women's role in childbearing and child rearing, uh, a good way to understand what gender equality requires in the 21st century is having a social reproduction and biological reproduction infrastructure uh, that understands uh, the skew historically uh, stemming from childbearing and child rearing and figuring out ways of setting up social structures uh, to make sure that women and men are equal participants uh, both at home uh, and at work. And of course, to the extent that um, part of the reason you have gender inequality in many societies and particularly in the United States is that the infrastructure of care um, has not really been um, robust uh, in the public sphere. That is, you might think of the reproduction infrastructure in many liberal capitalist societies uh, as being women, uh, unpaid for reproductive work within the home and ineligible traditionally and historically uh, for market work. Uh, and so even when women come into market work, uh, the market work is undervalued and underpaid uh, and uh, historically women are economically dependent on those performing reproductive work. Um, that is, um, that is they're, they're economically dependent on men because of their um, uh, reproductive work at home, uh, which is generally undervalued uh, and um, underpaid. Uh, and of course, uh, schooling comes into the picture because schooling is a very important way in which women have been relieved of social reproduction work uh, from at least from certain hours of the day, uh, nine to three in many societies. Uh, so schooling provides a partial infrastructure uh, that contributes to uh, the possibility of gender equality uh, for women. Uh, and it's a partial infrastructure because uh, it's only part of the day uh, and it doesn't start in many societies uh, until children are of a certain age say four or older, five or older, six or older, depending on where you are. Uh, and, uh, but of course the fact also that schooling doesn't start, and I'm talking about before pandemic times, schooling doesn't start until a certain age means that women's uh, work is interrupted. Women's careers are interrupted uh, when women bear children uh, and are primarily responsible for the care of young children before they go to school. Uh, and that also, even if they don't take time off, the perception of women's responsibilities in the social reproduction infrastructure um, lead to discrimination against women because they are mothers. Uh, and um, that leads to uh, both, the, both the, the combination of career interruptions or perceived effects of career interruptions on one's ability to uh, contribute to the economy um, leads over time to the underpayment of women. Uh, and then, of course, all of these things uh, are 
uh, amplified uh, by the pandemic because a very important piece of the social infra uh, reproduction infrastructure, which is schooling, uh, goes home uh, in most countries. Schools are closed and they're kind of re operating remotely, uh, but everyone calls it homeschooling because that's kind of what it is. And it's been very interesting to see the early data compiled by sociologists on this. So Caitlin Collins, a sociologist at the Washington University in St. Louis, has uh, suggested that women have reduced their working hours uh, much more than men uh, during this pandemic. Uh, and so uh, the, the fact that children who are at home from school then require some support, uh, there's some early data suggesting that it is mostly uh, falling on women, uh, but they're, they're, it's contested. 80% um, of women say that they, they are doing more. I'm, I, and I'm looking mostly at the United States, uh, there was a, an article in the New York Times uh, a couple months ago uh, that say that 80% of women say that they're doing more of the work at home. 45% uh, of men say that they are doing more of the work at home. Although there's a 3% of women say that their spouse is doing more of it. And that shows you also there are different perceptions of who's doing what at home. Uh, and uh, But in any case, I think there are early reports that um, this division of labor within the home, uh, even when both uh, parents are working remotely, uh, will generally tend to uh, burden women more, uh, which will in the long run, even when th the economy goes back to normal, uh, impact uh, women's uh, careers. And I think a major challenge and a major issue uh, is uh, has to do with the ineffectiveness of some governments. I mean, I think some governments have been more effective than others uh, in managing uh, both the spread of the, the virus and what it means for reopening the economy and reopening schools and what our priorities are uh, around there. Uh, because I think in many jurisdictions in the United States, businesses have been reopened before schools have been reopened. And that's also caused some conflicts because if women are now going back to work or expected to come back to work, uh, not in the home, uh, but schools are not open, um, that creates some conflicts. Uh, and, um, and so we've seen some, I mean, earlier, I, I think, I believe in June, the uh, Florida State University announced that when, when people were coming back to uh, campus to work, uh, it meant that if that was uh, an option, uh, then you would no longer be allowed to work from home if you also had caregiving responsibilities. There was a lot of uh, pushback against that policy and they've now clarified it. Uh, they've now clarified it though, uh, suggesting that you have to work out with your supervisor if you're working from home. What exactly are you doing with regard to care work? Uh, and so there's a kind of scrutiny, I think, of women working at home. Are they actually working at home? Uh, and there are some reports that women at least some women have been fired uh, from their jobs uh, because of the ways in which their children have inter interrupted their Zoom webinars. Uh, and so that's also uh, very uh, interesting and problematic. Uh, I think that prioritizing reopening businesses before reopening schools uh, definitely has uh, a gendered impact. Uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, we have to face the reality that uh, the pandemic has also maybe taken the stigma out of working from home, uh, meaning everyone is open, working from home, not only women. Uh, but I think if you're working from home and, um, and schools aren't open, uh, then, uh, then I think that there are people, there's a real question as to whether a so-called flexible work actually benefits um, people who have caregiving responsibilities. Uh, and then, um, and so I think finally, uh, so much of what, how we think about uh, gender equality moving forward is going to be connected up with uh, the way that governments manage the relationship between reopening the economy and reopening schools. I think that's fascinating, Julian. I think that the, the point about distinguishing between flexible work generally and what it means in a context where people have significant caregiving responsibilities is really important. And my own view about whether it continues is that you know we need to distinguish between working flexibly and working flexibly without childcare and they're very different uh, propositions. So 
if, if I think Ruth is going to jump in, but how does one, you know, we're going to talk about publication and uh, the Academy, but how have you managed to produce this wonderful new book uh, amidst it all? Do you have reflections on the personal level about how women scholars uh, and, you know, those committed to gender equality in their own lives can find a way through this to still create this kind of important public work? So yeah, thank you for asking that question. So the, the book was largely written uh, just before the pandemic began. So I was mainly in editing and production uh, since March. Uh, but I will say that one of the things, and I think this is true for a lot of people, uh, if you read the acknowledgements of many of our male colleagues, that you have someone uh, who's willing to take the lion's share of work at home while you're writing a book. Uh, and I'm very fortunate uh, that uh, my partner uh, did the lion's share. Uh, so there were times during the fall semester when I was working on the book and traveling and, and um, do, doing all that, or I, I would have late nights in the office because I also have the day, day job. I oversee a bunch of uh, programs in a large public university. So, um, so I would be in the office until like 9 p.m. Uh, and it meant that I was not home like two or three nights a week because I was uh, writing the book. And, uh, and I think in general, uh, nothing really productive gets done uh, without some invisible support uh, at home. Traditionally, I think that has been uh, women invisibly supporting men who are very productive. Uh, I think it's possible uh, to have a more egalitarian balance. Uh, and, um, and in some cases, temporarily, uh, I have to uh, say that I'm very grateful <laughs> that uh, in some ways I had an inegalitarian uh, balance in my favor for at least temporarily uh, while I was completing uh, this book, which draws attention to the importance of a more egalitarian relationship at home um, as a meaning for gender equality uh, in constitutions and particularly in in the way that uh, our debates in the United States about, about the Equal Rights Amendment have developed. Ruth, did you want to jump in at all on the issues around care and how we've managed it all or haven't? Just one minute, just more than a minute in, in response to some of the, the things that Julie was saying and, and to bring in the, the European perspective where uh, on average, before the pandemic, uh, women are known to work on average in European countries 26 hours versus nine by men. So yes, of course, someone who is used to working nine and adds three to those or four will feel, and it will be a reality that that person is working more. Uh, it still doesn't make up for the imbalance and that may account for partly the different subjective uh, reactions. But I also think that what that brings to the fore is, is the idea that this is, um, is, it, is it, it's, you know, there's two ways. It's uh, on the one hand, it's a more egalitarian distribution of care work between the partners. But on the other hand, of course, it's the question of how much the state takes on when it comes to, to shipping in, right? And of course, some of the most um, desolate and desperate uh, um, human beings <laughs> during the pandemic, as you can imagine, are uh, have been single mothers, solo parenting, you know, that, that has been particularly, particularly uh, strenuous uh, for them. Now, I, I do think that um, it, it, on the positive uh, side, um, I do think that uh, the, the situation, and I would be very hopeful if we really had, as Grania was saying, not just 10 or 12 countries run by women, but women on, on, on every domain, because I do think the pandemic has provided an interpretive context that really foregrounds the importance of care. I mean, it, it has become just so undeniable. So it's so invisible and yet it has become so crucial. I mean, it was all about care. It was that, that was, you know, it, it just, it was a setting in which caring was the only essential um, work in, 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 in different forms and it became very, very obvious. So I, I, I you know, there hasn't been like a global response, maybe a few signs of hope. I know that in some countries like uh, Portugal, they had a, a regularization of migrants, um, many of whom are domestic migrants working in, um, in, the, in the domestic care um, domain. In Spain, there's now um, reforms ongoing about 
providing unemployment benefits to caretakers. It just became so obvious that, you know, once you shut, you know, the homes from them, they're, they're completely um, without any kind of, of protection. So in a way, I think just like we had a moment historically in which women around the world united around fighting a, violence against women and then maybe uh, also parody and the spread of quotas, I would, I would say it's the time for the care revolution. And, and COVID has provided that, but unfortunately we don't have enough women in power. So we'll have to think of other more revolutionary ways of doing the revolution. Thank you uh, very much, Ruth. Well, speaking of revolution, um, one of the, uh, one of the interesting um, features of recent months has been that amidst all of the, um, the gloom and the hardship and the um, struggle that the pandemic has brought, um, we've seen a new uh, revolution, at least a, a renewed revolution in the field of racial justice that there is sparked by a particularly horrible uh, killing in the United States. But as we compare, as Ruth said about domestic violence earlier, it's just one in a long, long line of um, of racial violence, but also incidents, but also of, of many other types, less high profile types of uh, racial injustice, that there has been a sort of an awakening, not just in the US, but elsewhere about um, the need for a revolution in this field as well. But putting that moment, the, the renewal or revival of the Black Lives Movement um, in the US and worldwide alongside the pandemic, um, Ayola, we would love to hear from you a bit more about um, the combined uh, effects of the pandemic on communities of color and on women of color in particular. Um, you, you've written uh, interestingly about intersectionality and this is a, an area in which the layering of uh, disadvantage is really um, very visible. Um, so let me hand over to you um, on that. Thank you, Gronje, and thank you, um, Gronje and Ros, for organizing this webinar and inviting me to be part of it. Um, I have a few slides that I wanted to um, share. So if I can just um, share my screen and I'll pull those up. There you go. Um, just because I have quite a bit of data and um, I thought it's, it's more helpful to see the data rather than to just hear hear me repeat the figures. So yes, as, as Gronje said, we, we are really in the midst of um, two viruses, uh, I think, you know, the coronavirus and the virus of racism. And unfortunately, we see those two viruses over, overlapping in relation to COVID-19. So on this first slide, you can see here the um, differential impact in relation to deaths by COVID-19. This is just data for England, as you will be aware that the situation is the same in America. Um, what concerns me is that we don't have this data for the rest of Europe. And part of the reason for that is that most European countries do not disaggregate any data, whether it be in relation to health or schooling or education or employment, by race and ethnicity. So you will find data collected according to nationality and that can perhaps be a proxy for um, race and ethnicity. But in general, this type of data that we've been able to present in the UK is not available for the rest of Europe. And I have heard some reports that there was a question in the chat regarding uh, refugees. Um, I have heard some, some anecdotal stories about outbreaks in um, refugee homes where the individuals have been forced to stay, um, living in very close, unsanitary and dangerous um, conditions. But so, so this is the general overview. Um, as you can see there, the, the disproportionate number of deaths of black and ethnic minority people in England as a whole, um, more than twice the number of the, the, the population, and that applies to, to men and to women, um, a higher rate not only of infection, but also of death. And just to think about why, um, well, we've just been speaking about care. Part of the reason 
is that black and minority ethnic workers in, in England are predominantly employed in care, in the care sector, whether that be caring for the elderly in care homes or caring for the sick in hospitals and hospices or caring for um, children who may have learning disabilities. There is just a preponderance of this part of our, our uh, population working in that sector. And so they are key workers. So they've actually continued working during the COVID pandemic. So part of the explanation is that black and minority ethnic workers are more likely to be key workers. And key workers also includes, of course, transport workers. So those who are uh, driving our buses and our trains and our uh, refuse trucks and our ambulances, etc. So there's just a greater exposure to this disease because of the labor market distribution of black and minority ethnic people. And then of course, these, these working environments are to a large part, they haven't been made COVID safe um, simply because we're so, this pandemic is so fresh and so new. So their working conditions have been unsafe. So for many, many, many weeks, um, people go into work on the underground were all huddled together in, uh, in, in our small carriages. The irony is that in order to discourage the general public from leaving home while we were during our, our national lockdown, London Transport decided to use fewer trains, which then meant that those people who did have to go to work, including key workers, were forced to huddle together in, uh, in, in, a, in, in an even closer way, because there was just so, there were so fewer trains. So ironically, some of the measures taken to um, reduce the national spread of COVID-19 may have also contributed to its greater spread amongst uh, black minority ethnic um, women. And then of course, we need to remember, and these are some of the issues that were mentioned by Betsy at the start of this webinar, a number of these uh, women are in low income jobs where they don't have the option to be furloughed and where they don't have the option to, to stay at home. So the roles are precarious. As I've mentioned, they're reliant on traveling to public transport to get to work. And then a final factor has also been housing conditions. So because of the combination of the working in uh, a low income part of the economy, um, the amount of money left for housing is limited. So you find a number of uh, women in the black and minority ethnic community are not only living in quite cramped, cramped uh, areas of, of the cities, but also internally are living in multi-generational households. So all, all of these combinations, all of these factors together have been uh, suggested as reasons why there is this higher prevalence of infection and death uh, with COVID-19 amongst black minority ethnic women. Another startling fact, so women who are pregnant with COVID-19, 56% of these women are black and minority ethnic. Now, this is a, a very new, uh, a new data, and it really isn't understood at at the moment why this is, but it's an area that clearly is, um, there needs to be some urgent investigation and explanation for this, and also some measures taken to try to address this. Um, some more data, we've talked about these issues previously. So largely, I guess what I'm doing is just showing how the, uh, the, the issues of employment and debt and economic stress and lack of access to, to support and services is compounded by race in relation to, to COVID-19. So in relation to debt, 43% of black and minority ethnic women said that they believed that they would be in more debt. And you can see in brackets there, this is um, significantly higher than the number of white women. In relation to poverty, 25% of BAME mothers reported they were struggling to feed their children. 
In relation to access to support and services, 43% of disabled or retired BAME women had lost support from the government. So they had lost access to things like universal credit, which they relied upon to, to, to maintain their, their level of, uh, of um, their, their standards of living. And then around 50% of uh, these women said that they had also lost support from other people. So not only losing support from the government, but also losing support from friends, family, others outside of their household, simply because of the lockdown or because those people them themselves had fallen in and had lost their support. So inevitably, the levels of anxiety uh, amongst black and minority ethnic women are also very high, not only in re regard to going out of the house in general, but also going back to work. And we are in a situation now here in the UK where we are being encouraged to go back to work. The only difference is in relation to Leicester. Now you may have heard that uh, Leicester is uh, an exception because it's the first city in the UK where restrictions have been reintroduced. So on the 4th of July, most parts of the country were able to, to more or less go back to normal. However, because the rate of infection remained high in Leicester, um, the city and the county of Leicester were put back under the general restrictions that had been released nationwide. So there was a closure of work, uh, schools were closed again, uh, and and people couldn't go out to work, people couldn't go out to entertain themselves, uh, people, uh, children couldn't go to school. Now, uh, Ruth mentioned domestic violence. Of course, I could have mentioned that in relation to my general comments, but in particular, in relation to Leicester, women's charities there have seen a significant increase in domestic violence. This would, of course, have happened during the general uh, lockdown but with the reintroduction of restrictions in Leicester, this has again been exacerbated. And in particular in Leicester, the job losses have been uh, significant because Leicester is, Leicester is an area where it's a very multicultural city with um, a, a significant, perhaps evenly balanced number of, of people from uh, Africa, the Caribbean and Asia. And you do find a number of, um, family-run uh, businesses in which the women are employed, which places them in a, in a complicated uh, position of relationship, not only with the state, but with the, their partners, most likely, as their employer. Um, if, for example, they are, they are experiencing domestic abuse, then going to work is not going to be an escape from that domestic abuse if they are working in a family firm. If they are experiencing domestic abuse, then not being able to go to work is again going to make them more uh, susceptible to the incidence of domestic abuse. And if children are not going to school, then children again are going to be at home also experiencing that domestic abuse. Likewise, there's been an increase in child poverty because these women who cannot go to work are forced to rely on food banks and also debt services, which, are, which offer more expensive ways of uh, accessing credit. So, as I said at the beginning, I think we're really tackling two viruses, um, each compounding the other. And this was really uh, articulated nicely by Zubaida Haik, who is the interim director of the Running Me Trust. And she said that COVID-19 has brought the harsh realities of pre-existing racial equalities into sharp relief. And nowhere is this more manifest than the disproportionate social and economic impact of COVID-19 and black and ethnic minority women. And as I've just shown, the higher le levels of health and economic burden um, are, are just so, so clear for, for all to see um, in relation to COVID-19. 
Now, what do we do about this? So Ruth has mentioned that we need to centralize a culture of care, and I completely agree with that. But I think it's also a question of leadership. And this is a point made by Hannah Sversky, who uh, chairs the Centenary Action Group, which promotes equal representation in Parliament. Part of the problem is that there aren't enough black women at the table. So even though COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting black and minority ethnic women, uh, where are we at the table? White men make up the majority of, um, of the cabinet in this country. And I'm yet to see uh, a black woman at any of the government appearances. Um, I sit on uh, SPY B, which is a subcommittee of SAGE. So I am able to raise some of these issues there as priorities for, for research and reflection. Um, but I'm a single voice. And so in order to really embed the central concerns affecting black and minority ethnic women, a group that is significantly disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, I really think that there, there needs to be not just more female leaders, but also more um, black female leaders. Thank you. That is a Thank terrific so much, uh, uh, overview. Viola. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. And a great segue note going into talking to Michaela. I mean, we have limited time and interesting questions coming up in the chat as well, which I invite you to look at. But Michaela, it wouldn't pass Betsy's sniff test of empirically, uh, you know, uh, validated, but there's a strong intuition amongst members of the panel that female leadership has been important in driving a response. We've seen it across the Tasman in New Zealand. People have often looked at Angela Merkel in this context. How have things been in Germany and how much do you think her leadership has shown a kind of gender sensitive or more even intersectional appreciation of the challenges of care violence and the other challenges women are facing? Thank you very much for your question, Ros. I'm obviously not an expert as much as the others on this area. So broadly speaking, I think though we can say the picture in Germany has been pretty mixed. Overall, Germany has certainly been handling this crisis better than many other states. But then on the other hand, there were quite a lot of problems. And you know, there's the one woman on top doesn't sort of fix everything. It still means that in other bodies, decision-making bodies, there are many more men represented. And um, I mean, we've seen sort of some of the some of the features we see in other contexts we've seen in Germany as well. For example, there has been a crisis cabinet, a certain group of ministers um, meeting during the corona crisis. And that group, for example, um, did include women, but it did, for example, not include the minister of family, um, it, but whereas it included the minister of defense, the minister for the interior and things like that. So there has been a certain sidelining of women's issues, certainly in public policy that's been reinforced by some sort of expert bodies that have been drafting recommendations um, how to go about the crisis, how to deal with issues. And if, um, they were in the main group, there were, I don't remember now the exact numbers, um, but there was something like two out of 20 women represented in one group that was taken seriously with their recommendations um, in Germany overall. I think, I think the, the, the slogan was there were more Thomases on the group than women. Um, <laughs> So there's a question, uh, Michaela, from Stephanie Palmer in the chat about what role public law or constitutional law should play in addressing all of this. And one of the big debates in Germany of, of late has been around parity. Uh, do you have any you know, general reflections on Stephanie's comment or, or specifically relating to the parity debate? I mean, so broadly speaking, so I think the things that Germany does well is that Germany is a broadly functioning social welfare state, right? And a lot of things are state run. That's great for a number of things. So universities are state run. Nobody's being fired. We're not at least now talking about salary cuts yet. But um, more broadly, for example, each person also has a legal claim to have childcare in Germany. But in reality, that's often quite hard to realize and people would need to sue somewhere. And also then the offer of childcare is often something that people cannot actually accept. So that's sort of generally broader patterns where I think public law has certainly a role um, to play in addressing these issues. And um, more broadly on the parity point, Ruth has um, 
fortunately joined me in a little uh, symposium we've just done on this uh, Verfassungsblock on this. There's been this has been a debate in Germany ongoing since the last federal election when the uh, number of women representatives in the federal parliament has sunk, and we've now had some states passing laws obliging parties to um, hand in party lists that are alternating between men and women in order to achieve equal representation. And the Turingian, Turingia um, State Constitutional Court has just struck that down in, on July 15 now. And it, there's a similar debate ongoing in Brandenburg and in some of the other states. Um, so there is certainly a sense in which the absence of women in those bodies does play a role in shaping that policy. And I think this was something that was felt during the corona crisis, Merkel notwithstanding. School policies and school closures are mostly a business of state policy rather than federal policy. So it's hard for me to talk in more general terms, but I'm in a living in a big state, Nordrhein-Westfalen, where the policy has been going completely all over the place from one announcement to the other with absolutely no planning securities, either for parents or teachers. Um, and that I think has, I mean, they've opened schools now again, but for a long time, the, the, the slogan, the accusation in the public by some groups was, everyone is talking about how can, can we open uh, car, sale, uh, um, car salesmanships again. And that was something that was decided very early on. Now, there are good reasons, of course, why you would open you know, um, a place where you can buy a car rather than a school because they're different health concerns. But it tells you a little bit about the kind of issues that played a role in the public debate. But I think sort of German families and women have pushed back quite successfully against that. Um, and if I may make one last comment, and I know I should hand over to others, there's also been an interesting debate um, triggered by US um, debates about um, the role of race in Germany and whether there should be a constitutional amendment. So going back to your public law question, whether we should um, take the, the um, speak no longer in terms of race, so not have that, that term in the German basic law, but have different terms. And that, that's connected, however, to a debate um, whether there should be an explicit constitutional duty to do away with existing racial disadvantages, which is corresponding to what we have in terms of gender. There is an explicit loss um, with regard to that for men and women. There is now a debate whether that should be introduced with regard to race. So we'll see. At least there's some movement. That's good. So we have some um, excellent comments coming in, but we also have one remaining speaker, um, Marcella Priet Rudolfi. I, just before I turn over to Marcella, um, we would be finishing the, the webinar right now, but fortunately we have an extra five minutes, which we're going to use. Um, Ronya, I just want can to... I just suggest though that but Julie Sook had to leave and Betsy, you also mm -hmm. have another commitment. So feel free to drop off at the appointed time and we'll keep the sure. conversation going. But sure. thank you to Betsy and Julie. Many thanks. So just the questions I want to draw in because a number of people have mentioned them and then either if Marcella in, in discussing her uh, responses wants to reply or anyone before we finish up, a number of people are looking at this, not so much the silver lining, but saying, well, what can public law do? We've heard that already. And a number of ways that it's been suggested is um, the stigma has been removed from homeworking, the stigma has been removed, or at least uh, some kind of version of that has been removed from father's involvement in childcare. Is there any hope for policy reform on that? Um, is there any hope for, uh, as Rube talked about, gender impact assessments of, for example, the, the EU's coronavirus response? Um, is there any move towards racial impact assessment of COVID? Um, Michelle asked whether women leaders, we've talked about that a number of times, and I think Michaela touched on it a little just now, saying that it's not just that Germany is a woman leader, but also the nature of the political, social um, system and institutional infrastructure in Germany makes a difference. What is it about societies that elect women that makes it more likely that there are better responses to crises like COVID? Um, and there's a question about the impact on LGBTQ plus communities and advocacy. And finally, a difficult one, but very legal, whether COVID can be considered as um, potentially releasing people from their contractual obligations. Those are the, some of the questions we have, but we want to turn finally to Marcella um, to ask, you don't have to answer all those, Marcella, but we want to ask you a little bit about the impact, something we've talked about with Julie, um, on publishing, on uh, not just your own personal experience of that during the pandemic, but as a member of the editorial board of the Icon Journal, um, the impact on women, on their research, on their academic lives, and on publishing of this pandemic. 
Um, thanks, Marcella. Thank you, Ross and Grania, for um, having me here today. So, well, yes, obviously, um, even though academia, I would say, is a relatively privileged um, social sphere, we're going to see the same trends that Ruth, Ayola, Betsy, Michaela, and Ruth have been discussing replicated in um, academia as well. So as we know, women are on average more likely to have care responsibilities. And this doesn't only include mothers who have care responsibility towards children, but also towards elderly relatives, parents, etc. And these are care responsibilities, of course, that um, are um, perhaps unfairly distributed in the sense that even though a woman may have a male partner or there may be other males in the family who could take care of these responsibilities, women are often the ones who end up um, taking care of them. Also, women are more likely to provide emotional support uh, to several people, which um, I would assume is something that would take considerable time, even that we are in the midst of a pandemic. And they're also more likely to occupy service roles in universities. So that takes a lot of planning on committees, which is something that a lot of universities are precisely going through right now, trying to face the pandemic. And finally, they're also more likely to find themselves in precarious academic positions, that is, in non-tenure track positions or as adjuncts. All of these, of course, will uh, result in women being less able to publish at uh, the time, right? We have women at home with no childcare usually, or even if they have no children taking care of other people inside and outside their family circles. And we have seen this um, in ICON, but not only in ICON, but, we've see, uh, but several journals have seen a significant increase in submissions. And of course, a decrease of submissions authored by women. This is true of ICON as well, though perhaps a little bit less so than other journals, I think perhaps because ICON is um, an international journal, so we get submissions from all around the world and the pandemic has developed differently all around the world. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, we saw a decrease in women's submission, but now some countries are returning to normal more or less. So we've seen a bit of a stabilizing in the numbers. And we were also going to find that um, some journals had simply to close uh, because of the uh, numbers of new submissions they were getting. And uh, fortunately, we haven't had to close, but we have seen the same trends. And we also have seen uh, the unavailability, of course, of peer reviewers, right? Because again, people are at home uh, with care responsibilities. And um, I suppose uh, this is all just, of course, um, replicating trends that we find in society. And I suppose that part of the problem is, and this relates to, I guess, questions about what public law can do, is um, how uh, even today, care responsibilities are thought about as individual responsibilities, as things that women should figure out for themselves in the uh, unit of their families, right? And this is true for all family units. This is an individual problem. You have to figure out how you're going to both fulfill your professional responsibilities and fulfill your care responsibilities. And institutions have largely mm -hmm. been absent from this conversation, as we can see from the fact that schools are not opening in um, the United States in many states. And we've seen something similar in other places. And I think, um, Insofar as we still think as a society of these issues as first women's issues, but second and more importantly as individual issues, we are going to struggle to realize this, that these are basic issues that I guess a just society should have to deal with through public law and through um, different kinds of policies. So a call to arms for government and policymakers to find a way through so that uh, we can regain the, the sense that there might be, uh, you know, as Ruth said, a care revolution on, on the horizon and uh, greater prospects of gender parity and equality rather than the, the more pessimistic assessment, which I think may, you know, have a lot of force to it that Betsy opened with that the full extent of this hasn't yet uh, landed and that the gendered effects of COVID are going to be with us, not just for weeks and months, but for years. 
even decades ahead, as well as those intersectional effects that Eola has very, uh, you know, clearly illustrated in the UK and beyond. I'm afraid we're out of time. A sign of a great seminar is when you could go the whole hour again over and, and keep talking. There are so many of the comments about migrants, about LGBTQI and the role of men stepping up that would be uh, worthy of further discussion. The good news is that um, we will uh, be inviting these sorts of things to be a subject of discussion in iConnect and all the other fora around ICON. And in, a, in just under uh, half an hour, the forum around gender and public law that is being um, convened and brought together by Gronje, Michaela and Marcella will commence a discussion and we invite you to join us and be part of that conversation, as well as to continue the debate in all the other fora available to us as a community. Please join me in thanking uh, all of our panelists who've given us terrific insights and uh, their time. I think, you know, in an era when we talk about COVID and gender and care, it's especially important to note that so many people joining this panel have had to, you know, figure out ways to get their children to be quiet for the uh, 59 minutes or put aside other demands. And so we note that and we are especially grateful and our thanks to the team at ICON, Fred, Sergio, uh, you know, Richard and others who've helped disseminate, publicise and make possible the logistics of this webinar. So thank you all very much on behalf of Gronje and myself and the Society for joining us and to our panellists for terrific insights as well as to our team that helped put it together. We hope that you'll be able to stay on and join the conversation in one way or another uh, in ways that keep the focus of us as a community on the gendered challenges and impacts of the pandemic. But let's hope it goes away soon, but I fear it won't. And so we'll have plenty more opportunities to reflect and think about how we can do better and start the, the revolution that uh, Ruth has called for.